Baptism. Church history. 102 this time. Church history 102. Page 291. I kind of skipped over this just a little bit. There was a book written by Daniel Rogers, a Church of England man, on page 291. He said, Touching what I have said of the sacramental dipping to explain myself a little about it, I would not be understood as if schismatically. I would last deal a distaste of the church in any weak mind by the act of sprinkling water only. But this, under correction, I say, that ought to be the church's part to cleave to the institution, especially it being not left arbitrary to the church, to the discretion of the minister, but require to dip or dive the infant more or less, except in cases of weakness. See, there always effusion. Sprinkling and pouring is effusion. It is not baptism. It is not baptism. For which allowance in the church we have calls to be thankful and suitably to consider that he betrays the church, he that betrays the church, whose officer he is, to a disordered error, if he cleaves not to the institution to the dip the infant in water, and to this I do aver as thanking it exceedingly material to the ordinance as not no slight thing, yes, with both antiquity, though with some slight addition of the threefold dipping, for the preserving of the impuge trinity entire, constantly without exception of countries cold or hot, witness unto, and especially the constant word of the Holy Spirit, first and last approached as a learned critic upon the Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, hath noted that the Greek tongue wants not words to express any other act as well as dipping, if the institution could bear it, the treaties of the two sacraments by Rogers. The Baptists never failed to quote Rogers in support of their practice of dipping. They said that they dipped and sprinkled all right or poured, but still, that was the wrong mode. The mode of baptism is very important. Now, we're going back and forth in history. We'll go back to 1620s, 1640s, whatever. Now, the Presbyterians on page 293 who changed the practice of dipping in England, the rise of sprinkling for baptism in England is traced back to Dr. Philip Schaff, which I, this is where I finished in the last uh, class. But over here, on page 294, in a 1556, a book was published in that containing the, the form of prayer and ministry of the sacraments approved by the famous and godly learned man John Calvin. Now here, John Calvin is the father of what? The Presbyterian Church. In which the administration is enjoined to take water in his hand and lay it upon the child's forehead. These Scotch exiles who had renounce the authority of the Pope. Now, remember, the Catholic Church, these people, Martin Luther and John Calvin, left the Catholic Church protesting. These are what we call Protestants. Baptists are not Protestants. Baptists never were part of the Catholic Church. These people were part of the Catholic Church. The Anglican Church is never part or was a part of the Catholic Church, and it became the Anglican. That's what we call the English or the Protestant Reformation in England. It wasn't a Reformation at all. They just, the king became the head of the church instead of the pope. The 
English Reformation was not a Reformation, really. It was a, it was a Henry VIII took possession of all of the Catholic property in England, which actually was English property, and he took over the churches. Any of the ministers there, the priests there that wouldn't follow what he said, got to go back to Spain or wherever they came from. And now the Scots, some of these Scottish people that are under Knox and Calvin's teachings, these Scots exiles who had renounced the authority of the Pope implicitly acknowledged the authority of Calvin. So sprinkling basically came from, the practice of sprinkling came from Calvin. Not the Church of England originally, not the Catholics originally, but Calvin was going to substitute sprinkling because the Catholic Church and even the Church of England was using baptism by, by effusion, something besides baptism. And returning to their own country with Knox at their head in 1559, established sprinkling in Scotland. From Scotland, this practice made its way into the reign of Elizabeth, but yet was not authorized by the established church. In the Assembly of Divines held at Westminster in 1643, that's what we call the Westminster Confession of Faith too, it was keenly debated whether immersion or sprinkling should be adopted. 25 voted for sprinkling and 24 for immersion. Barely made it. And even this small majority was obtained, the earnest request by Dr. Lightfoot, who had acquired great influence in this assembly, sprinkling is therefore the general practice of this country. And many Christians, however, especially the Baptists, rejected it. The Greek word for baptism means immersion. The Greek Orthodox Church, or the Greek Catholics, still immersed. Not only that, but when in uh, 1123 A.D., when the Catholic Church established celibacy among their priests, the Greek Orthodox didn't follow that way. They had their priests still got married, and they had a whole lot less child molesting and the molesting of the wives, the parishioners' wives in the Greek Orthodox Church than he did in the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church from 1123 on, it was rampant. It didn't start in 1920. It started in 1123 A.D. That just goes back a little bit now. <clears throat> For sprinkling properly, so-called, it seems that it was the year 1645, instituted, or in instituted then the beginning and used by very few. And then it was carried on in uh, France. The Presbyterians introduced effusion in England and basically it went on into France. Lastly introduced in France. For a long time the revolution had been brewing in England and it came with the Civil Wars of 1641 and then remember the Civil Wars also, that was the year of freedom for Baptists, that's when they came out of hiding. The result of the war was not only the overthrow of the King of the Law of, and Laud, but it overthrew the Church of England as well. The Presbyterians took charge of the ecclesiastical affairs in the Kingdom. They set out to reform everything. The Westminster Assembly convened and put forth the Confession of Faith in the form of the Church of Government, which bears that name. One of the things which they reformed was baptism, and that they substituted the sprinkling for immersion as the law of the land, and the reformed churches of Calvin practiced pouring. Pouring. Nipto, Rontizo, but not baptizo. And so must the reformed Church of England, since Calvin did. And they took hold of the matter with a bold hand and time seceded, thus pouring through the Westminster Assembly, prompted for the time in England with all the, the prestige of Calvin. It was no easy task to accomplish. There was stubborn opposition, and when a vote was taken, the exclusion of dipping, there was a tie vote. 
and Dr. John Lightfoot, who had acquired great influence at the assembly, procured the deciding ballot and vote. Lightfoot gives his opinion, and please forgive me, I'm, my eyesight is failing me, and I'm not able to read as well as I did before. I need to get better glasses, which are not in my budget at this moment. <laughs> then we fell into the work of the day and was about baptism of the child, whether to dip him or to sprinkle him. Well, why would you want to baptize a child anyway, except you wanted to make him a member of the church and the state? to control the masses. You control a child when he's born, if you demand that he be baptized within so many days or find the parents, then you've got control of the child because he's now a member of the church and state. You can tax the child, you can do whatever you want to do. Before that they couldn't do that. You remember baptizing but infants all began way back yonder when the church and the state were formed with all the way back to Constantine and 325, Constantine. That everybody would be a member of the church and the state and he went out and he conquered with the sword. Remember, that's the way Islam does and that's the way Catholicism did. They went out and conquered with the sword. And this was a proposition, it is lawful and sufficient to besprinkle the child. Had been canvassed and before adjourning and was ready now to vote, but I spoke against it as being very unfit to vote. <coughs> that it is lawful to sprinkle when every one grants it. Whereupon it was fallen upon, sprinkling be granted whether dipping should be tolerated with it. In other words, no, stop dipping. Not only, it, it, there's only one form of baptism, now it's going to be sprinkling, it's going to be rod and teaser. It's not going to be baptized, baptism, it's not going to be pouring, but it's going to be sprinkling now. And here fell upon the large and long discourse where the dipping were essential, or used in the first institution of the Jews' custom. Dipping goes all the way back to Abraham, they say. It definitely went back to the time of Jesus, and the Jewish customs. Mr. Coleman went about it in a large discourse to prove that dipping be overheard, which I answered at large after a long dispute. It was at last put to the question whether the directory should run this way. Then the minister should t shall take water and sprinkle it upon his, in his hand and sprinkle it upon the face and the forehead of the child. And it was voted so indifferently that we were glad to count names twice. For as many were so unwilling to have dipping excluded, that the votes came to a equally within one vote, 25 to 24. For the reserving of dipping and 25 against it. And there were a great heated battle upon this subject. When we're all done, we can we can succeeded and concluded upon nothing, but the business was recomm recommitted. Now as we go on, now in uh, 1648, we looked at the confession of uh, the Westminster Assembly Confession in the Parliament page 296. And now we come over here to page 297. The law directly replaced immersion by pouring and it was passed on January 3rd, 1644 and 1645. And it was not however until 1648 that the Presbyterians were enabled to enact the gag law. You know what a gag law is? You remember what happened here in this courtroom in, in New York, the gag law? That, nullifies, that nullifies freedom of speech, is what it does. So now we have the gag law in it, instituted by the Presbyterians. They had 
already substituted pouring for dipping, but they went further and enacted a law to punish the Baptists as blasphemers and heretics. Remember, Calvin killed a Baptist. Luther killed Baptists. They called them Anabaptists back then. It was enacted that any person who said that the baptism of infants was unlawful and of such baptism is void, or that such persons ought to be baptized again, or in any pursuance therefore shall be baptized, any person formerly baptized, shall be placed in prison. Now this is 1648. We had a real short time of freedom. When Abraham Lincoln, back then going back to America, when he started the Civil War, which he did, he started the Civil War, if you read the, read the preamble to the Constitution of the United States, it says that when a period of time comes that we think that we can no longer live with such parties, that we shall separate from them, that's exactly what the southern states did. There was acts in Congress and in the Senate to do away with slavery altogether and to annihilate slavery. And the southern states were working with this. The Civil War was not started over slavery. It was started over states' rights. And they wouldn't have freedom of speech. Anybody in the North under Abraham Lincoln did not have freedom of speech. If you spoke against what he did or what he was doing, you went to jail. If you had a press, it was taken and confiscated. And anyone that spoke for him was paid a little extra money, gratuity. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a sacred thing. Abraham Lincoln went against freedom of speech. He, had, he arrested people in the North, not in the South. He arrested people in the North and put them in prison and suspended habeas corpus. Now that's a, that's a piece of history which you don't hear. They shall be placed in prison and remain there until you to find two sufficient sureties and they shall not publish the same error any longer. Under this infamous law, 400 Baptists were thrown into prison. This was the triumph of pouring in England and reached its culmination in 1648. Pouring began in 1649 but became a classical law in 1643 and a civil law in 1644 and 45 and was vigorously punished in 1648. Remember how you start a practice and it becomes a tradition and then it becomes a dogma. And those who held to dipping were punished as heretics and blasphemers. And sometimes that was a death penalty. These did, thus did pouring prevail in England. The law was placed with the fall of the Presbyterian, and the old law for immersion was reenacted by the Church of England. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. <clears throat> the Presbyterians brought it in with their reforming two novelties. One was that baptism came in the room of circumcision, and that hence that an infant ought to be baptized on the faith of his parents. You can't believe for your children. We wish we could, couldn't we? Don't we wish? I mean, if you're a godly parent, don't you wish you could believe for that child? Don't you wish you could make the decision for them? Don't you wish that you could pick their mate? Really? They did that, you know, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. You picked the child's mate. Sometimes the guys sold their daughters as for money. And sometimes they tried to find someone that loved them. You wanted somebody to be able to pay a big dowry for your daughter because you wanted her taken care of by somebody could, that had enough wealth to support her. The other was the pouring was the pouring was baptism, and that it was commanded by the scriptures. 
this was a novelty. The Baptist forthwith replied that immersion alone was taught in the New Testament, which is a fact, isn't it? They did not change their position, but they did change the accent. Previous to this time, there had been no occasion for this emphasis. They were practical men and only combated error with, when it appeared. It is remarkable how speedily they de deleted this new error of the Presbyterians. They grew up in, in the reign of Charles I, one of the most tremendous debates on baptism known in history. It raged continually see, from the year 1641 to the close of the century. That means 1700s. The Presbyterians had brought, it, brought in the innovation of pouring. The Baptists now, for the first time, permitted legally to speak answered boldly. It has been sometimes said that the Baptists had just adopted immersion. That's not true. You weren't a Baptist until you were dipped. But the evidence is to the contrary. Now, the who was trying to say that the Baptists, who were the people saying that the Baptists just adopted immersion? The people that were enemies of the Baptists. And sometimes your enemies, have you ever had two enemies? that hated each other, but they only got together when they wanted to do you in. <laughs> Enemies make strange bedfellows. There's still a great debate on baptism. Daniel Featley, on page 299, states that the Baptist churches were in the practice of dipping. He was born in, in Charlton, Auction. Oxfordshire, March 15, 1582, and died in Chelsea, April the 17th, 1645. He was pretty old for that time. He had in 1541, 1641, a debate in Southward with four Baptists. Shortly afterwards, he published an account of the debate in his book, The Dippers Dipped. In the dedication to the reader, he says, I could hardly dip my pen in anything but gall. He hated it. He was personal witness to the acts of baptism of that period. He says for 20 years writing in 1644 that he had lived near his residence and had been in the practice of dipping. The words of Featley are especially significant that he spoke of the Baptist from personal knowledge. And there are no reason to believe that he exaggerated the facts about them being dippers or dunkers. He was a Baptist hater. Now let's go on further. On page 301, Featley not only affirms that there had been Baptists long in England, but he connects them with the Baptists of 1641, and he says, Of whom we have to say, as Arrhenius sometimes spoke of the heretic Eben, the father of the Ebonites, his name in the Hebrew signifies silly or simple, and such God what he was. So we may say that the name of the father of the Anabaptist signified in English a senseless piece of wood or a block and a very blockhead, that the Baptists were blockheads but they practiced church succession and they, they practiced baptism or immersion. A very blockhead he was, yet out of his block were cut those chips that kindled such a fire in Germany and Halesia and Swabia that could not be fully quenched and, and extinguished, so not with the blood of 150,000 of them killed in the war and put to death in several places by administrations. 150,000 Baptists were killed. Now, Sharon brought out something after the class the last time, which I covered in the back, but she couldn't be in those classes. The Baptists came out of Armenia. The seven churches of Asia were just a few of the seven churches, or of the churches of Asia. And when the Muslims came into an action, now they were already persecuted 
heavily by Baptists. Not Baptists, but by Catholics. By the year 600, we have Muslim world. The Muslim world went in there and they basically chased all the Christians off or killed them. They don't tolerate other religions. The Catholicism didn't tolerate other religions. And so they went up into Europe. They went into Germany. They went up in Switzerland. They went up in Sweden. They went up in all of the areas and all the countries around there. And you can go back, as Sharon said, back into Sweden. You can go back into Germany. They were called Wiedertoffers in Germany. And they migrated from this area in the churches of the valleys of the Piedmont. There was an ancient group of churches up there that came out of Armenia. And they said that they have some of the autographed scriptures from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or Paul, or whatever. That the Catholic Church went in there and they burned, they, they tortured, they ate the women. They, they would take their breasts, cut them off, and fry them in fires and eat them. They would march around with stakes run up to their innards, marching around with these women and men. They killed them, they burned them alive in caves, they did all kinds of stuff to them. And they spread from there into Germany, they spread into China. They spread all over all of the country to get away. Now some of the Amish and some of the Mennonites today that came to America, some of them came through China, some of them came through Russia, some of them came through Germany. Some might come from Bosnia, they come from all of these different countries where they had been scattered by the Muslim invasion. And then when they scattered in these countries, they had to hide from the Catholics and from the Church of England and from anybody else that had a church-state religion. A church-state religion. All of these things you see, you can be thankful today for however long we still have this freedom of speech. Today that we have a certain period of time in history right now where we can preach the truth. But sometimes the truth in yesteryear involves what the practices are going on in America today. And I bring that out at times. And sometimes people are not happy with that. Because history is repeating itself over and over and over again. Our Father, we send this message out. Again, that you might touch people's lives with it. You might understand where we are in history that they might understand the basic doctrines of the Bible that the things that Baptists have taught down through all the ages they have died for by the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And Father, please use it wherever it goes for your honor and glory. Please forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name.